So why don't we just start with a uh, quick introductions and what school uh, you are from or what your organization is. And um, since we will be not seeing each other until February again, what is something you're looking forward to over the holiday break or the winter break? So I am Mary McGrath. I am from San Mateo County Office of Education, and I am looking for, forward to some time off. And I will pass it on to Connor. Good morning. I am Connor Sines. I'm the school counselor at Ortega Elementary School in Pacifica, and I'm looking forward to seeing my parents. Um, Nicole, you're up. Well, hopefully you guys can hear me because my computer seems to be frozen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Nicole Scott. I am the school counselor over at Oak Knoll Elementary School in the Menlo Park City School District. And I guess I'm looking forward to spending as many days as possible in my jammies, drinking hot cocoa, <laughs> and watching tons of uh, fun films. And who would you like to pass it to? Um, let's go with Danielle. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle Keho, and I am a middle school counselor with Jefferson Elementary School District. And just like everyone else, I am looking forward to break and cuddling up and watching Christmas movies. <laughs> uh, and I'll pass it to uh, Hillary. <laughs> Hi, Danielle. Long time no see. <laughs> I work with Danielle at Ben Franklin. What is the question? What are we looking forward to? I'm going to Canada. I'm looking forward to and somewhat of a trepidation about international travel. You know, it's, it's Canada. I'm excited. Great, thank you. My daughter's up there and I haven't seen her during COVID. Oh my. Yeah. Very exciting. Okay, who would you like to pass it to next? Uh, raise your hand if you haven't gone yet. I'll pass it to Katerina. Hi, I'm Katerina. I uh, work in Belmont for two elementary schools as the school counselor. Um, and I am most looking forward to being at home with my animals because they all just kind of give me these sad looks when I leave in the morning. So <laughs> they will be thrilled. And I will pass it to Jay. Hey there. Um, my name is Ed Jay, and I'm a school counselor at uh, Valamar School in uh, Pacifica. And I am looking forward to just being able to have relaxing, slow going mornings and uh, nurse my coffee and hang out, and just chill out. So. And I will pass it to, I can't remember who. How about Bridget? Good morning, everyone. My name is Bridget Hernandez. I'm a high school counselor at South San Francisco High School. Um, I'm also looking forward to hanging out with my pet. I have a very energetic Dalmatian, and so just really excited to, to hang out and kick it. Um, I will pass it to Meg. Have you gone, Meg? No? Hi everyone, I am a Climate Corps Fellow with the San Mateo County Office of Education, and I am planning a trip to Joshua Tree for Thanksgiving, so nice. I'm very excited about that. I'll pass it to Nicole, I think hasn't gone. Uh, no, oh, she has. Oh, sorry. How about Andra? Andra. I can jump in. I'm Andrew Yguin. I'm the Environmental Literacy and Sustainability Coordinator at the San Mateo County Office of Ed, and excited to, to share out with you all today. And the thing I'm looking forward to the most is I have little ones. I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and I'm like really excited to to have Thanksgiving, but then to like get our Christmas tree out because we it's like an extravaganza. So I'm super excited. <laughs> Thank you. And Shalane. Well, good morning, Shalane Peterson, support staff for Space and Supportive Schools. I'm also looking forward to international travel, but I I'm, have that trepidation also, but I'm sure it's going to work out great. Thank you. And then welcome, Marie, Maria. Um, we're talking about where we're from and what we're looking forward to over the winter break. Thanks for the warm welcome. Sorry for my tardiness. Um, 
I'm Maria Keo, the wellness counselor at South City High and winter break. Um, I haven't planned yet. It feels like it's still so far away. Um, there may be a little trip to Disneyland, but it's not quite in the in it's not quite cemented, but we'll make it happen. Great. Well, thank you all for for sharing and for showing up today. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and we'll get rolling. Here we go. Whoops, present. Okay, so today um, we're gonna do as always our welcoming ritual. And then we have <clears throat> Andra here for us today and then time for you guys to connect about what she is presenting because it's it's really exciting. So um, today for our welcoming ritual, we're inviting you to have a quiet moment of visualization. So you're welcome to turn off your screen if that, if that helps, um, but we encourage you to close your eyes, think of a place in nature or out of doors where you feel happy and at peace. And as you visualize this, kind of pay attention to what's around you. What do you smell? Do you feel breeze or wind? Do you hear the trees rustling? So just take a minute and really just be in that place. Maybe take a couple deep breaths in and out. And then slowly return to the room. One of the great things about um, our experiences in nature and being outdoors is that we can carry that with us as a resource um, at times when things are really stressful or um, there's just too much stimulus happening. We can escape there in our mind, but better get to escape there in real life. So thank you for that. So what we like to do now, um, I think we can do a couple different breakout rooms, Shalane. Um, so we'd like you to describe your experience when you're out of doors in nature. Does it feel like a sanctuary to you or is it uncomfortable? Are you like, I'm the kind of person that likes to go skiing from the inside of the lodge having a hot toddy, or if it's someone I just really like to be in the snow? And how does it make you feel? And then also to think about what are some ways we currently utilize at experiences out of doors to support and educate our youth? And what are some other things that would be helpful for them? So, um, Shalane, like two or three, what do you think? Breakout rooms? Uh, yes, I did too. Okay. So why don't we take, um, what time is it? Why don't we take eight minutes? Um, so it's not a lot of time, but just if you can visualize maybe like where, where you just were, what you were just visualizing and how does that feel for you? And then how can we bring some of that to our youth? Okay, opening rooms now. Should have received an invitation to join a room. SMC, we folks would all go in the same room. Oh. I decided to stay here. Sorry. I didn't know you put us in our own room. <laughs> no worries. Maria, did you get your invitation? Can you just put her in a room? She may be taking a call or something. Um, she's already, she has to accept the invitation. Oh, okay. I'll broadcast the TV prompt. There she is. Okay. Both prompts have been broadcasted. Welcome back, everybody. 
So who has a specific place in mind when they think of nature, when they like do their visualization? Is it the same place that you go every time? Let me actually stop sharing for a second. Okay, Hillary, what is, what, where is your place? Is it a imaginary place or is it a real place? Oh, you're muted. It's a real place. I, I grew up in Connecticut between high school and college. I worked for Connecticut Conservation Corps. Oh. And um, one day we were working at really hard work. Like there was this ground, it was all hard. We had to like dig it up and it was hot. And we took a break and I lay down on this rock in the middle of the stream. And I remember lying there, tired, sweaty, but in a good way, and really feeling connected to the water and the rock. And I actually had this like transcendental moment where I felt like I was the rock. It was so powerful. And I was imagining how long I had been there as the rock. Anyway, that is where I always go whenever I have this kind of exercise, when it's assigned to me or when I need a peaceful place for myself or when I'm explaining it to other people. So yeah, it's a real place. Oh, and I, I visited it. I visited it again, you know, and it just looks, it doesn't have the same power when you just look at it. But, right. But it's, you know, I visit it sometimes. I love that. And then does someone want to give an example of how we're using the outdoors to support our kids or, you know, either education or like the self-care part that being connected to the environment? I mean, there's outdoor ed, but Jay? I'll quickly say, I mean, this year, more than ever, um, I, I find myself more often than not, you know, whenever it's appropriate, more often than not, I'm out and about walking and talking with students who walk around the track, around the big grass field area with the trees all around. And I think that's been definitely a positive, mm -hmm. um, you know, for not only for the students, but also I, I get, I enjoy it. So it's like a win-win for everybody, I think. So that's, I'll give them the option, you know, would you like to walk on the track or walk on the school? You know, it's, you know, they, they can kind of decide, but usually they want to walk, so. Yeah. Also, especially when you're working with, uh, <laughs> they sometimes do better if they're not looking at you, but like if you're walking side by side that they get a little more open. Okay, well, thank you for participating in that exercise. If you've not had a chance yet to sign the sign-in sheet, uh, Shalane's dropped that in the chat. We would really appreciate if you could do that. Okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen and um, want to, whoops, sorry, that's not it. I'm not gonna share my screen. You don't need to look at my budget. Um, I'm gonna, <laughs> I mean, would like to introduce um, Andrea, uh, you, you going? Yeah. You're going, yeah. Thank it's you. I almost had it. Um, she is our coordinator of environmental uh, literacy and she um, requested to speak with us because there's so much, uh, especially with what just happened in Scotland, there's just a lot of anxiety with our youth about uh, climate change and sustainability and Andrea's got her thumb on the pulse and is has all these great options for moving forward. So take it away, Andrea. Great, awesome. Well, I'm really happy to be here with this group and um, I feel like we've gotten more connected with school counselors across the county um, in the last couple of years. So I'm excited to be here and share a little bit, but also hear from you as well about some of the challenges that you all are dealing with in regards to eco-anxiety or um, climate climate trauma. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, we're looking at climate ready counseling and how we can address eco anxiety and climate trauma. And I'll just I'm going to share my screen, but I'll also put in the chat box the slide because I know some people would like to have that a little bit more close up. Um, and then I will walk us through a little bit of this. So just to give a little bit more background about um, where we're coming from, we launched an initiative at the County Office of Education in 2017 to um, be focused around helping schools prioritize environmental literacy and environmental sustainability. And then we added climate resiliency the next year in 2018. Um, and, the, and the goal is to really have our schools be models of sustainability and climate resiliency. And we were the first county office in the state of California to do this. Um, now there's about eight other county offices in the state doing it um, out of the 58. So it's exciting to see how the mo movement is growing across California, but also how it's growing across our own county. Um, and what some of the key things that we do is to really try to get um, this work across the entire school. So really helping our school districts and our school sites think about how, what can you do in your facilities um, to, to provide access to sustainable and um, climate resilient 
spaces? What can you do in the curriculum? And then what can you do in community and culture? Um, and so today, the stuff we'll talk about, we'll really look at all, all of that and how it, how it goes across all four, of the, or all four of those different areas. We have quite a few different programs, just to quickly share that. You might know teachers or students who've participated in some of our capacity building programs or maybe a principal at your school. Um, we also have a lot of networking programs where we're trying to help schools get access to community-based partners. And then we provide a lot of customized technical assistance. I think just a few weeks ago, I was on a call with a mental health coordinator and also on a call with a, a school counselor at a high school, just really providing that customized support of like addressing the needs that they have for their community. So hopefully we'll be able to do that for all of you moving forward. But I want to turn to the actual topic that we're looking at, which is how does the environment and climate crisis impact the physical and mental health of our students? So I'm sure you all have your own experiences with students who have expressed challenge or who may have experienced some um, some climate trauma and they come in and they're they're really, you know, heightened anxiety. So I want to just break that down a little bit to talk like a little bit more about the theories behind this or the research behind it. So I'm just gonna show these images and give people a moment to think about like, when you think about the environment and trauma, here are some of the issues that we might be, that might be causing traumatic um, experiences for our kids. So when you see these images, what emotions do they bring up for you? And you can just put that in the chat box or you can share it verbally if you'd like. Yeah, so I'm seeing different different emotions come through frustration, anxiety, sadness, hopelessness, right? Definitely. And some of the things to think about here is which populations really bear the brunt of these environmental injustices, right? And so you might be thinking, oh, that's really the kids in my community, depending on where you're working or where you're living. Um, it could be, you know, your direct community or it might be the, the community right next door. So that's the issues that are going on. Sorry, my slides are not moving. When we think about just unhealthy environmental situations, that has been um, referred to now as the pair of ACEs, right? So we, I know everybody here is probably very familiar with the adverse childhood experiences, um, but the pair of ACEs is talking about the community environment. And this is where all those environmental um, pollutions and disasters, where all those things fit in, is this idea of the deterioration of your physical environment, which has like physical uh, health issues, but also mental health issues as well. So now to add on the layer of the climate crisis, give people a chance to do a very similar thing. What emotions come up for you when you see these climate related issues, such as wildfires or flooding or drought or high heat? And I'll just pause and give people a chance to do the same thing, put some ideas in the chat box. Yeah, so I'm seeing different words come in, fear, despair, sadness, and oops. Again, similar thought. Uh, sorry, I don't know what's going on here with my, my little slide deck, but that's okay. Um, our districts and our schools are actually really dealing with a lot of these issues already, right? So we in our in San Mateo County we have the least amount of air conditioners per capita in the state, and that's true in our schools as well. So that's an issue in terms of high heat days. Um, we are dealing with wildfires. We Fires contribute to the most school closure days in California. And of course, um, we, I think a lot of people know that coming along with that is the public power shutoffs and also air quality issues. Um, we have experienced flooding in our county and we've also, where 34 of our schools are very vulnerable within this decade to sea level rise and are already experiencing that on their school grounds. So definitely we are experiencing the impacts of climate change and that can be really scary for adults, but also of course for children as well. So a third realm then of the uh, adding on to the pair of ACEs is this idea of climate trauma. And um, right now the research shows that currently almost every child on earth is exposed to at least one climate shock. 
um, and that children born in 2020 are going to experience a significant increase compared to older generations um, to the to the point of like triple of the amount of disasters. So we know that our children are are they experiencing that and that it's going to continue. And I can say myself, I'm I'm almost 40, and I know I can see that my quality of life has declined in the last 15 years due to climate related issues. So I can't I can imagine that for my kids born into that that it's going to be even harder. Um, so that's a lot, that's a lot to handle. And I, I know that I'm always like the, the doom and gloom lady and I'm sorry for that, but we're going to get somewhere helpful. I just want to make sure that people have that kind of reality of where, where is the data? Where is it at? So there's a lot of different global organizations and, uh, national organizations really asking for this call to action and really asking people to be aware of just how much climate change impacts our physical health, but also our mental health. So the overall health effects are, are really overwhelmingly negative on not just our environmental systems, but our social and economic systems. The CDC really has recognized the health impacts of climate change. Um, so again, back to that idea of like it's physical, but it's also mental health issues. Um, and then as you get into some of the outer um, areas of this diagram, you can see like also you're dealing with like forced migration and then you're gonna be dealing with like, or we are already dealing with resource conflicts. Um, so there's a lot going on here that can be really overwhelming to think about. Um, and also we're already dealing with this crisis. So, and this is the American Psychiatric Association also kind of making their own graphic, but getting at that same thing. Um, but I think the thing that's really important to note here is that they really put in who are the most vulnerable to these issues, right? So it's children, it's elderly, and it's um, those who are, who have physical disabilities as well. So that that's, you know, we're, we're dealing with the children and we're dealing with youth um, and they're, they're very vulnerable to these issues. In fact, a recent, two recent studies came out um, done in Stanford and also in partnership with an a organization in the UK really highlighting what's going on for youth when it comes to eco-anxiety and climate anxiety. So three quarters of youth said that they thought the future was frightening coming out of that study and over half said they felt like humanity is doomed. So we can imagine that the, um, the eco-anxiety that our kids are having is well beyond what has been in the past. Um, and I think this part here at the bottom is really scary, this idea that many of those who were questioned in that survey felt betrayed, ignored, and abandoned by adults, um, which is just compounding. Not only are they dealing with anxiety, but they're also dealing with this like enormous frustration with adults. So I want to just pause there and give people a chance. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen and just give people a chance to reflect. And I, actually, Mary, would it be okay if they go back into breakout rooms for a few minutes to reflect? Okay, awesome. Like just five minutes to just share like what resonated with you, what, what emotions are coming up for you as you look at that. Okay. Oh, I can make the breakout rooms, huh? Or whatever. I don't know what makes sense. Um, I'm opening them now. Just a moment. Okay, thanks. Okay, you should have received an invitation to join a breakout room. Okay, welcome back. I was um, just sharing with Mary before we start, like when we came out of the first break room, I said, thank you so much for starting with a nature based activity because it helps like it helps ground us in this like safer safe place and this love for nature and then I, I'm gonna I knew I was going to come in with the like, and also it can be really scary and threatening but uh, and how do we hold both of those things. So I just want to give people a chance to share out from your breakout room if any anything that surfaced or any sort of trends that you saw um, across the commentary that came up in your breakout room or any questions that have come up. Hi, good morning. Um, just one of the things I shared with my group was that I, I'm an elementary school counselor and I struggle a little bit with so many things that are out in our world, um, how to balance our discussions and make sure that we're like giving kids hope and 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 it's just so powerful for these little six-year-olds i mean we do a lot of work around environment that's one of my lessons for april is all about um environment and then we have this wonderful volunteer that comes in with her worms and goes to all the classes and teaches teaches them about composting and we you know do lots of trash pickups just trying to get the kids um we've had the watershed 
come out and show about how important it is to keep stuff out of the drains and what that does to the oceans. And we've been teaching them about the ocean um, cleanup thing and how it's getting that stuff out of the, the garbage patch. So trying to balance, you know, that there are, we're making some gains here. Yeah. Um, but, but making sure that we're not putting so much on the kids when some of these are adults like responsibilities and you know what I mean? Like finding that balance yes. that not only are they dealing with racism and the environment and the pandemic and it's like, oh, it gets so heavy. It does. It really does. And actually that's a great segue into like, what can we really do and how can we, how can we find that balance? So I'll, I'll go forward a little bit in the presentation and move us into that segment. And the, the document that I'm going to refer to, um, which I'll actually put page numbers on it. So I'm just going to put it in the chat box now. Um, the document I'm going to refer to, the first part covers what we just did in, in the slide deck format, right? With the, with the, what is the environmental trauma? What's the climate trauma? Now we're going to get to the second part of the document, which is really about like, what can we do about this and how do we find that right balance? So let me share my screen again, and I'll walk us through a couple of the things that we have um, identified in the last couple of years to, to support schools. So how can schools integrate trauma-informed practices with sustainable and climate-ready school practices? So the, um, the framework that we use here in our county to talk about trauma-informed practices is this one. Is everybody pretty familiar with this? Just give me a thumbs up if you've seen this before. Okay, a lot of you are saying yes, great, awesome. If you're not, this is a great one to go a little bit deeper on and the, the links are for that in the document, but also in the slide deck so you can go a little bit further on it. But the idea here is that we're really figuring out what are the different things that we could do to, um, to address these issues. And what we did in our, um, in our work is we, we overlaid sustainable and climate resiliency to this framework so that people could think about what are some strategies that we could do. So right now, in terms of the compassion and dependability is that um, climate change can really leave, or in this situation, people will feel isolated or betrayed. We just said that over 50% um, you know, of youth are feeling like things are doomed, and many of those youth do feel isolated or betrayed. And you can see that with all the protests going on, or youth are actually suing the government for an action on climate change. So in the document, we actually put forward some suggestions on starting on page four of what can you actually do in your community to address that? So here on page, sorry, this is on page five now because the document got a little longer. Um, you can host annual or biannual town halls. There's stuff that can go on in the curriculum and instruction. And then there's stuff that can happen in, um, in the campus and operations. And there's other things that can be at the policy level, like passing a board resolution. So those are just some examples of what schools can do. Um, I'm going to also just address something that, uh, that our last person just said here is this idea of that it shouldn't just be children taking care of the earth, but it's a yes and situation, right? Like, yes, of course, we want our children to know that they are going to have some role in helping to, to take care of our earth. But this image is really about adults working, um, you know, adults working on it too. And so there needs to be, and I actually have another image that is like adults and children working together on this. So what can educators do to really repair that trust is that they can step up and say like, we want to, we want to help do something here too. One other example is around safety and predictability. So this gets to that kind of like timeline. How do we balance this out in a timeline? So trauma, you know, it unpredictably violates our physical and our social and emotional safety. So what can we do to really plan out how to become more safe and predictable? And some of the suggestions we have here are is really thinking about having an environmental or climate climate crisis working group that can look at the data and have a better understanding of like, when do we need to be ready to address it? So if you think about, um, you, if you think about each school year, what happens in the fall? Like what are some of the climate traumas that we deal with every single August and September? Do you mean like fires? Yeah, exactly. Right? Our schools because the smoke is so bad. Yeah. Like we know, we know that August and September and October are gonna be full of fires, public power shutoffs and air pollution, air quality issues, right? So that's something that we can then build into our programs of like people's tension is gonna be heightened because of the climate crisis. Well, that season's not going away, it's only getting worse, right? So we know we can start preparing for that instead of being like caught off guard and shocked every time, oh my gosh, it's wildfire season. Like, no, we know the data says it's wildfire season every year and it's gonna be bad every single year. So let's put a plan into place, like whether it's books that we're gonna read with children, whether it's like, you know, firefighters coming in to talk with them, like whatever it is, let's put a plan in place to address that, right? When you get into the winter season, what are we gonna start seeing? We're gonna start seeing our flood 
floods and our um, more impact of sea level rise because you're having floods and sea level rise at the same time. So those are different things that seasonally we can do to really think about like, what are the anxieties that our children are gonna have? Some of them are still gonna happen randomly and we don't really know, but we can have a sense just based on weather and, and uh, data of like what kind of things we can prepare for. And as counselors, you can have a heightened sense of like, oh, we know that we're gonna have a certain number of disasters around this time of year. Well, we know that because there's gonna be so many high heat days, people are gonna be super tense this time of year. Um, and so those are just different ways that you can advocate at your school site to say like, we need to be prepared for this. We need to have like a plan in place to deal with this kind of, these kind of issues coming up. And then having things like, um, we have this solutionary and environmental book list having things like things ready to go in the library or on your shelves or with teachers so that they can they can actually read books that will help kids process it or they can do things in their curriculum. So those are some of the ideas that we have there. I'll just share one or two more because I know we're getting really short here on time. Um, but yeah, having that data, understanding the data, data and preparing for it. And then really thinking about how do we empower our students um, and how do we do that with solutionary practices. So if you go to the, um, let's see, where's the, solutionary part here. There's so many things that we can do in our community and culture to really support our students in terms of empowering them, like having opportunities for them to bring projects to their campus and make change happen. Um, even if it's really small things like getting rid of single single use disposables in the lunch the lunchroom, like kids feel like how that's connected to all this. Um, so there's a lot that can happen on the in between curriculum and campus and like having green clubs and things like opportunities for kids to really voice what they want to see change and, and to actively do it. All of that stuff can really help our students feel like they're making a difference and that they have some level of control over their future. And when adults ally up with with students to do this, it feels really good for them. So those are just some of the ways that you can think about this in terms of that framework. Um, I do want to give people a chance to also just like bring it right back to you, you personally, though, like what can you do? Um, and so I always think about like, what can you do someday and what can you do Monday? Hopefully many of you have uh, Monday off next week, but I know some of you are still your school district goes through on Monday. Um, but one thing you can do is very similar to what we did in the very beginning, um, you know, doing that nature connection, doing that nature connection time. We have a document that's really focused around trauma-informed nature connection activities. Mary, you know, gave an example of one that you can do. And this document, there's like at least 10 or 15 more. So you can build that into your practice and really think about which ones of those would work well for your practice. You can also share any of these resources and what you learned to advocate for the school to really prioritize addressing the climate crisis and eco-anxiety. And then the last thing I wanted to share is that we are going to be working with the researchers who, who did that eco anxiety survey across the across the world. Um, some of them were at Stanford. We're going to be working with them starting in January to develop a pilot program just specifically for counselors um, to help build capacity to support um, addressing eco anxiety and climate trauma. So it'll be a mix of workshop trainings and also campus based uh, how to how to really develop a campus based initiative to do this. So if that's of interest to you, I'll just put a survey in the chat box. You can just fill in the survey and I'll, I would reach back out to you in January um, as we start to develop that pilot program. So I'll just pause there and see what kind of questions or comments people have um, before before we finish up our seg segment. Andrew, is there going to be a cost associated with that counselor group? Oh, no, it would be the opposite. Hopefully there will be a stipend for participating, oh, okay. um, but not positive yet on that. Okay. Yeah. When we save the world together, we try not to make people pay for it in our in our program. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I do know that sometimes that has to happen. Well, I'm just super grateful for all that you are all doing. I'm hoping that you do feel like there's possibilities and pathways forward. If any of you do have any individual questions, don't hesitate to follow up. I do want to help you specifically with the, you know, the customized needs at your site. Um, but we are here to we're here to help. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Andrea. I mean, I've seen these presentations, but like you keep adding stuff to it, and I learn stuff every single time. Great. Thank you so much. Awesome. I, I well, really appreciate care. this. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. And then I found this quote um, that I loved. That was, he's from Oxford, and he says, as soon as we realized, hence the English spelling of realized, um, the cure to climate anxiety is the same as the cure for climate change is action. It's about getting out and doing something that helps. And so um, lucky me that that actually matched what Andrew talked about. <laughs> 
Um, so what we wanted to connect it to, and um, I think we're just going to leave this as just informational at this point, is that we've been going over the five SEL competencies and seeing how it, it inter the different topics we cover interact with those in, um, SEL competencies in your work with youth. And um, really feeling that, I mean, all of them kind of are related, but specifically for the climate anxiety is self-awareness and responsible decision-making. And so um, if we could do maybe another one last breakout room for about five minutes um, to just discuss as a group, given your grade levels, what are the important developmental skills to learn as it relates to like the SEL stuff that we're doing with our youth, um, as it relates to the climate um, anxiety, and then what strategies or interventions, a lot of the ones that Andrew just covered, can we utilize to support this? So basically what I'd really like is just for you guys to get with your with your colleagues and talk about kind of where does this all fit in together in, in the work that you're doing. Okay, opening rooms now. Okay, welcome back everybody. So we're, uh, curious about what are some of the, um, sorry, let me get this. What are some of the strategies and interventions that will help your grade level of students to address kind of the echo anxiety and connection to SEL? I guess I can go. <laughs> um, I think what really hit home for me was when Andrea said, what can you do Monday and what can you do someday? Um, and so I was I was thinking about, we, ha we already on site have a gardening club. And so maybe trying to co-facilitate that once or twice a month um, and turning it into something someday, um, like something great, like an, an environmental club, an, an own environmental club or an elective class even, where we get kids involved in really, you know, being up, taking responsibility for their planet. Um, and it's not just this obscure idea of we live on planet earth kind of thing. So um, yeah, that's kind of what we talked about. That's great. I love that idea. Andrew, are you aware of any other schools doing something similar or? Oh yeah, lots of schools. So we have a good understanding. Of, I think about 50% of our schools do have a garden on site and whether or not they're like dead beds or not, uh, they have something. Uh, some, many of our schools do have green clubs. We are helping, we've started mostly in the high school space of helping the high school districts and the unified districts kick off district-wide sustainability committees. Um, and now we're starting to move to the K through eights to see if we can get similar models happening there. but. We're seeing that that has really relieved a lot for the kids who are experiencing the most amount of like, I need to do something, I'm feeling super overwhelmed. We're seeing that that's providing some some really safe outlets for them to feel like they are um, in allyship with adults in, in doing this work. Thank you. Okay, so last time sharing my screen. Okay. So this is our question. So that was our share out. So um, basically, uh, our optimistic closure is kind of along with what Danielle was just saying is what is something that you're going to try in the next month based on today's conversations or something that you learned from Andrew's presentation? So go ahead and just unmute yourself and share or just go ahead and put it in the chat box. Well, I just sent an email to our middle school. I think it would be fun for our green team to connect with our middle school's green team and maybe do a project together. So we'll see. Hopefully someone emails me back. That sounds great. What about an elementary school? Like some of the younger ones? Oh, just to be clear, I am an elementary school. But oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were high school. Sorry, I got No, no, I'm an elementary school and getting our, our little ones to connect with our older kiddos. Okay. So then my next question is, what about high school? <laughs> we have, a, uh, I'm not sure if it's called an herb club. I'm ashamed to say, I don't, I don't remember the name of the school, uh, of the club. But anyway, they um, took a, a, a blank space 
and turned it into a, a um, like a little mini park with benches and planted trees. And um, so kids can go out there and, and, and read and just relax. Um, Benjamin, do you remember what, what they call that space? I have one of my, one of my colleagues right here. Um, one of our teachers says she's been doing this for years, um, working with uh, the environment and so forth. So, but this time they really changed, they, they just changed the whole outlook in that whole area. It's like really, really nice area. And so they, and all the kids did all the work. They planted the trees, they, they, they turned the ground over and the whole nine, they did everything. And I think it was all through, um, through volunteer, not volunteer, but um, what's it called? Outdoor learning space. There we go. Very good. Thank you. Um, it's really, really, really nice. Creating great Creating spaces is huge. Yeah, it's nice. It's a very nice um, area. Okay. And I think they have two uh, on top of one of the buildings. Um, she incorporated like out to lunch staff. The staff want to take lunch, go on top, go on the top of the building, <laughs> bring a lawn chair and have lunch outside on top of the building. <laughs> I haven't did that yet, but she's encouraged that. So we have a really good staff member who's really into the environment and, and um, including everyone. Ms. Clements, she's really awesome. That's fantastic. Okay. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, Hillary. Yeah. So I want to thank you again all for being here. Thank you to Andrew for presenting this really valuable information. And um, so the links are, we'll forward the links out. And uh, Shalane, do you want to review what the um, other players are that were in the chat before we head off for the day? Sure. Let me just drop the School Counselor Community of Practice. That's where you are right now. It'll show the next date, which is February 10th. We also have um, a really great conference coming up here at the county office, Art as Life. I encourage you to check that out here. Um, we also have a new community of practice starting in the spring. That's the CSEC community of practice. Uh, the dates are on the flyer. And that's all I have for you. And just in case CSEC's a new term for you, that's commercially sexually exploited children which has been on the very much the rise in our county, particularly since um, the lockdown started. So um, there's been enough interest in it that we are starting a community of practice to address um, the concerns we're seeing in the schools because the kids still generally come to school. So we're the, we're the first ones that see them and try to get them support and prevent them from entering the life full force, so. Okay, oh, and Danielle? Um, I just wanted to, because I was talking about it with Jay and Katerina, that um, our kiddos um, at a couple of our schools in our district is doing a program called Venture Free. And so they focus on environmental sustainability and environmental responsibilities with kiddos, outdoor survival skills. And it's just um, really great. They go to all of our local um, beaches and outdoor um, areas and, and, and the kids really love it. And so um, if, you, if anyone's interested, I put the link in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Any other last announcements or? Uh, we also have our symposium for At Promise Youth. I also dropped that flyer. And this year it's gonna be focusing again on students experiencing homelessness. And we've got a quite a lineup of speakers for you. Um, our, our, key, our keynote is someone who was herself homeless as a teen and lived in her car and had experienced a great deal of abuse and all of the risk factors we worry about homeless she experienced and she is now the CEO of the largest nonprofit in Santa Clara and run it for unhoused people and like has several properties where they can live and it's really amazing plus she's a really great dynamic speaker so we encourage you to sign up for that and it's free and the first hundred people sign up get a book so so um, since we're not meeting again till February 10th, have a great holiday season and winter break. And may we all have lots of times in our jammies with hot cocoa and our pets. And seeing family we haven't seen in a long time. So take care, y'all. Thank you.